Uh, holiday weekends and kind of the last nice weekend of the of the season. A lot of times I uh, try to sneak out, but I'm glad you guys snuck here first, and hopefully you have a, a bit of your weekend still left that you get to enjoy. Um, tell me if you can relate to this. Uh, does it seem like wherever we are, we are, we're rarely settled wherever we are? Anybody ever, anybody ever relate to that? Like you what's next, whatever that, that next thing is. Um, and, and some of you are already doing that. You've already checked your watch and you're already thinking about lunch. You're like, where are we going to, like, I'm here now, but I want to go later and I want to go eat. And so you're already kind of thinking about that. Sometimes we're like that. We, we get unsettled where we are and we get kind of consumed with what's coming next. And so for the next few weeks, this series, Pack Your Bags, it's a series about this, how to prepare to get to where you got to get to from where you currently are that you just got to from where you recently were that you can't even remember how you got to. So that's what we're going to talk about. And so and let's all try it together. Let's all, no, I'm kidding. Like, listen, no, I'm just kidding. Don't say it together. Here's the, here's the short version of, of this series, right? Here's what we want to talk about for the next few weeks. We want to talk about how to prepare for what's next, right? We all have a what's next in our lives. And hopefully, whatever it is you have that's coming up next is something you're looking forward to. Hopefully, it's something you're excited about or Maybe you're a little bit nervous about it, or you feel prepared or a little bit unprepared. Um, maybe you have something, for some of you, have something coming up next Tuesday, right? Like some of you, some of you students have some stuff coming up Tuesday. And they're like, what is that? You have to go to school. Like, remember, you're supposed to go to school. Some of you have already been in school. Some of you started already. Um, but so some of you have some things coming up in the next few days. Some of you can think and you're like, you know what, I have some things coming up. There's some things that we're looking forward to in the next few weeks or the next few months or that within the next year we have something that we're trying to accomplish or, or we're looking forward to. Some of you, maybe it's not that. Maybe there's a, a three- or five-year window and you're like, you know what, these are some of the things that are coming up next. But hopefully, hopefully it's something that you're looking forward to. Um, here's, some, here's some possible next ups for folks. I don't know where you land in this, right? Graduation, that might be a next up for somebody, you know? And somebody's like, yeah, I'm graduating from kindergarten this year. Well, that's awesome. Like, I hope it goes great. Or, or maybe it's you're graduating out of, you know, elementary to middle, or you're graduating from middle to high school, or maybe this is your senior year as a high school student, and you're graduating from, maybe some of you are getting ready to graduate from college, hopefully. Right? Right? <laughs> getting there. We're getting there. Uh, maybe for some of you, college is what's next up. Some of you are like, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm taking a little break now. But, but college is coming. That's what's coming up next for us. Um, some of you, maybe it's a wedding that you're preparing for. It's coming up. I don't know if that fits any of you personally, but maybe it's somebody you know, or it's a son or a daughter or a sibling or something like that. For some of you, maybe it's a baby, right, coming up. That's coming up. And for some of you, it's another baby, right, which is pretty awesome because I don't know. We had friends when we had Caitlin. We had a little bit of a gap between our oldest daughter, Caitlin, and Cameron. And so, I don't know, was it six years, seven years, right in there? And, and I remember for a while there, we had, we had friends that used to tell us, like when we had Caitlin for so long, they're like, well, you haven't really figured out how to parent yet. And I'm like, we're doing good. Like, we're rock, this is, we're rock stars. We're figuring this thing out. And they're like, oh, wait till you have two. And then we did. And it was like, wow, yeah, that's, it's different. So if you're going from one to two, it's different. If you're going from like eight to nine, that's different, right? It's, it, it's different. So, so. Maybe next up is a new job or a new school. Maybe that fits where some of you are at. That's your next up. Maybe empty nest. And maybe that doesn't happen like right away, but it's coming up pretty soon. And you're trying to figure out if you even like the person you're going to be spending that empty nest with. I don't know. Um, I still remember the phone call I got from my dad after he re retired. Um, and he was at home all the time. The kids were kind of gone. And he, he called just desperately asking. He's like, I don't know if we like each other. Like, he was afraid to spend that much time at home with my mom. And it was like, hey, we all moved out. That's on you. I don't know. Whatever. you got to figure it out. Maybe retirement is a next up. And maybe that's not this year. But maybe you're like, hey, that's the next big thing we're thinking about. We've, we've, we've gone through the empty nest thing. But now that's the, the next thing that's coming up. But so hopefully, hopefully we'll all have something coming next that we're looking forward to. And, and, and you're excited. And, and I think I could say this about a lot of the next ups you're probably stressed out a little bit about it. And, and, and that's totally understandable. And here's why, right? 
whenever things are coming next, it requires some transition. We have to transition toward whatever's next, right? And whenever we transition toward something, that means something's going to change. Somehow, some way, somewhere, something is going to change. And change always brings about stress, even when it's a good thing. Have you ever thought about that? Like a lot of times we think stress is like, oh, it's so horrible, it's so negative, and, and it can be. But stress comes anytime there's, tra- anytime there's transition or there's change, stress is a part of it, even when it's good change, even when it's good transitions. And, and, and let me just share with you why I, I believe that's completely true. You ever, have you ever had a conversation with the mother of a bride-to-be? Like it's exciting and they're stressed, right? They're just, they're, they're stressed out about it. Or, or maybe new parents, they're excited about this new baby coming, but they're also stressed out. How about parents taking kids to school, right? That's an exciting time, but it's also a stressful time, um, especially, you know, depending if it's your first, that's always kind of a challenge, like, oh, the, you know, the first time you take your, 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 your oldest or your firstborn to school, it's, that's always kind of a stressful time or, or wherever it may be. Um, there's, there's a story in our family, and, and, it, and it relates to my youngest sister, Krista, and, and her first day of kindergarten, and, and we've, we've talked about this in our family oftentimes, that my parents, um, there was a bit of a gap between me and my baby sister, so there's about six years between myself, and then there's another sister kind of inserted um, in there. And so, um, so when they were taking my baby sister, Krista, to kindergarten, her first day of kindergarten, my mom was really emotional. Like, she could care less about the fact that I was starting seventh grade that year, and I had to ride across the entire town on a bike that was kind of rickety that I put together. She could, no helmet. That's back, there were no helmets back in those days. Like, we didn't wear helmets. We didn't wear pads. You just, you prayed and you rode. That's kind of what you did. And she wasn't really concerned about that. She was more concerned about my baby sister Krista going to kindergarten that first day. And I remember they were so nervous about it and they were so worked up about it. And so everybody gets home at the end of the day and, and, and they ask Krista, they're like, hey, how did school go? They were so excited for her and everything else. And she's like, there were too many kids there. And so we're like, yeah, you go to school, there's kids there. And then she's, and, and, and on top of that, I didn't learn to read. And you said that if I would go to school, I would learn to read. I didn't learn to read, so I'm not going back. That was her response. <laughs> And so it led to a second stressful day for my parents. Like they had to convince her that, no, you actually have to go back to school the next day. And so we all have these things. But here's the question. Here's the question we're going to wrestle with. Are there things we can do now to prepare us for what's next? And the reason I pose the question is I think for all of us, there are things coming next in our life that we have never experienced before. Not that exact thing. Maybe something similar, but not that exact thing. So there's things coming that in our life that we're looking forward to that we've never actually experienced, but can we really be prepared for it? And I believe the answer is yes. I think there are some things that you can do now that will help you be prepared for what's next, and that's what we're going to talk about for the next few weeks. Before we dive too far in, let me just share with you a couple things we want to keep in mind, right? Because these are things that if we lose track of these, it's going to kind of derail us. And here's the first thing. Regardless of what you're packing, no matter what it is that you're packing for what's next for you, whether you're, you're stepping into a new job or it's a new school or it's a new relationship or, or new city or marriage, whatever it is, here it is. Along with everything else you pack, you pack you, right? So along with everything else you're taking, you're taking you. In other words, wherever you go, there you are. Right? You're like, wow, that's deep. That's why you come to church on Sundays, to get deep. No, but this may actually be one of the most important things you hear today because wherever you go, that's where you're at. And, and, and this is so important because in our minds, we fool ourselves into thinking that in this next season, I'll start whatever. That, that once I move out of the house, then I'll begin. Or once I get married, then I'll begin. Or once I get more financially stable, then I'll start. We begin, we fool ourselves into thinking that once I get to the next thing, whatever that is, then I'll begin doing whatever it is I probably should be doing to begin with. And we kind of fool ourselves into thinking that. Somehow we believe that a, a, a new view and a new do creates a new you. That's not true. That's not true. That somehow once we're in a new environment or we have a new set of circumstances, and I've heard this, I've heard this so many times, and I've even thought this way, that once I'm in a new environment and once I have new circumstances, then everything will automatically and magically naturally fix itself. Have you ever heard that? Just listen to some of the stories of lottery winners. 
listen, a lot of those stories are horrific. It, it, here's, here's people that, in, in some cases, they weren't doing a real fantastic job of managing their money to begin with. Then they won a whole bunch of money, and then 10 years later, they have no money. And it's like, well, once I got all this money, I knew it was going to fix everything. Wherever you go, there you are. You took you with you. You took the same habits and the same tendencies and the same strengths, the same weaknesses, all of those things. The only thing that's changed is your environment or your circumstances, but you are still you and you take you with you wherever you go. Here's the second thing that we have to keep in mind as we think about preparing for what's next. There is no necessary correlation between knowing what's next and being prepared for what's next. And somehow we fool ourselves here. We think just because we know we're prepared. That's not true. That's not accurate. There's no necessary correlation between knowing what's next, whatever that is. Here comes graduation. Here comes marriage. Here comes college. Here comes children. Here comes retirement, whatever it is. Just because you know it's coming doesn't mean you're ready for it. If you think that's true, you know, if, if, if you want some proof, every single Saturday, right, and some Fridays and Sundays, young men and women dress up. They invite all of their friends and family into this place, space, whether it's a building or outside, and they stand in front of all of these people, and they make these promises and take these vows, and they say at the end of it, I do. And, and you guys know, if, you, if you've been married for a while, you're a few years on the other side of I do, just because you say I do doesn't mean you can do. It just means you plan to, but you don't know if you can do. You're just promising to do what you don't really know you can do, and you're not sure they can do either. But you stand up and make these vows and take these promises and say I do. Just because you know what's coming doesn't mean you're prepared for what's coming. Here's my point. Way better than a plan and way better than a promise is preparation. That, uh, that preparation will trump a plan and, tr and, and, and preparation will trump a promise every time. And so I think that's why this series, I hope, will connect with our lives. And, and I think it's important for all of us that are, that are looking forward to something that's coming next. Here's the good news. The good news is we're going to get some help with all of this today. And we're going to get some help from James. And James had a famous brother. Anybody remember who James's brother was? Jesus, Yeah. The interesting thing about G James is that he didn't become a follower of Jesus until after the resurrection of Jesus, which I always thought was pretty amazing, that he grew up with a perfect older brother and still didn't believe he was the son of God until the other side of the resurrection, which is probably pretty interesting. But James is going to weigh in on how to prepare for what's next. And in fact, at the end of the section that we're going to read this morning, James makes this promise. He basically says, if you do what I'm telling you to do, if you do what I'm suggesting you to do, here's where it will end. God will bless you for doing it. Pretty powerful stuff. James says, if you do what I'm about to tell you to do, in the next season, God will bless you for doing it. In, in essence, there's something you can do in this season to set yourself up for success in the next season. That there's something you can do right now that will help you prepare for what's next. And that's a, I think that's a really big deal. Um, at least for me, I, I you know... I'm a pastor, right? I'm a preacher. So whenever we open God's word and we start to read, we're like, a lot of times we'll read this and go, okay, well, you know, James, the brother of Jesus said, or the New Testament said, or, or the Bible said, we should do this, so therefore we should just do this. But let me just share with you kind of the other side of this, the other side of this coin. I've gone through plenty of transitions in my life. I, I've pastored for over 17 years of people walking through changes and transitions in their life, and I'm here to tell you that there is truth and there is proof to what James says, that if we'll do some things now that God tells us to do, it'll set us up for success in the next season. There's proof and there's, there's truth to that. And I can tell you from personal experiences that God will bless you for doing what God, through the pen of James, is going to tell us to do. So here's, here's what James tells us to do. He says, don't just listen to, or, or in our context, read, right? So when James is writing to early Christians, yep. A lot of them didn't walk around with full versions and copies of the Bible, right? They didn't have the Bible to reference. A lot of them didn't even have scriptures in their homes. A lot of folks didn't have those kinds of things. So they went to synagogue or they would go to these churches that were propping up, popping up and, and they would listen to the word. But we're in a, in a place in a time where not only do we get a chance to listen to it, we can also read it. So don't just listen to or read God's word. You must do 
what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. In other words, don't fool yourself into thinking that just because you heard God's word or just because you read God's word, that that alone is going to make any difference. If you believe that hearing it or reading it is going to make the difference, then James says you're fooling yourself. And, and, and this, is a, this is kind of a big deal, especially for us church people, right? There's something in us that believes that since, you know, since I was in the room, I'm a better person. You know, since I showed up and sit in a chair or I sat in a pew, I'm a better person. Since I showed up to life group, I'm a better person. Since I've attended church three weeks in a row, I'm a better person. Or since I've read my Bible three days in a row, I'm a better person. And while it's true, a lot of those things are good and a lot of those things are great, don't fool yourself into thinking that just because you showed up or just because you read it, that automatically you're going to become a better person as a result of just hearing it, Right? That it takes more than that to make a difference. So what makes the difference? James says, you have to do what it says. It's not enough to just hear it. It's not enough to just read it. Let me, here's one, and, and I hope we all love each other after this. It's not enough to just be convicted by it. And, and we do that in church world a lot. Like, man, ooh, yeah, mm. Well, like, sometimes we even do that stuff out loud. Ever notice that? Like, every once in a while, like, people are like, you're sitting by somebody and somebody says something. I've done it. I've sat in a, in a church service and some of Mike last week was preaching and I'm sitting by Carrie and I'm like, ooh, mm. Like, we do this loud, like, it's almost audible. Like, people around you hear it. I had a friend, um, a gentleman that I met years ago, I was preaching a revival in, um, in Michigan and he had just become a Christian, just he had become a, placed his faith in Jesus just a few weeks before that and he was attending this revival and after the, after the message, um, like the second night, he comes up to me, and we were getting, we're chatting, and he says, oh, can I ask you a question? I'm like, yeah. He goes, he goes, what's with the Christian moo thing? And I had no idea what he's talking about. He's like, yeah, when you were talking, like, people were going, mm. Like, he goes, what is that? Like, why do Christians moo? Like, do I have to do that if I'm a Christian? I'm like, yeah, you have to. That's part of being a Christian. You have to moo or something. I don't know. But, it's, but sometimes we kind, of, we kind of do this thing. We have this idea that, hey, you know what? I'm going to go to church. And I'm going to hear something that speaks to my heart, that, that points, me, points out some areas that I'm falling short in, and I'm going to be incredibly convicted by it. I'm not going to do anything about it, but I'm going to be convicted by it. And because I was convicted, I get credit with God. See you next week. And that becomes our religious experience. And James says, really? Where'd you come up with that? Like, where did you read that in the Word? Like, where did you come up with that whole idea? The goal isn't to just hear God's word. The goal isn't to listen and go, you know what, I ought to, I should, I know I better. The goal is to do something with what we've heard or read. Here's what James says. He says, for if you listen to the word and don't obey, and now he's going to give us one of the, what I think is one of the best illustrations in all the Bible. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. And, and, and here's James' point, to listen to scripture, to listen to the truth taught, and not do anything about it is like getting up in the morning, looking in the mirror and going, that's horrible. And then you just kind of go about your day, and you like get dressed, and you go get coffee, or you go to work, or you go to school, or you do whatever. He, he says it's like getting up and seeing your face in the mirror, not doing anything about it, and then just forgetting what you saw. When we look in the mirror, we're reminded that something needs to be done, right? Otherwise, why look in the mirror? When we look in the mirror, we're reminded that something needs to be done. James says, when you hear God's word or you look into God's word and you don't do anything with what you hear, it's like seeing something but not doing something, which is something that none of us would actually do with an actual glass mirror, right? We wouldn't do that with a real mirror, but James says that we'll do that when we look into the mirror of God's word. When we look into an actual mirror, when we see something, we do something. And here's why. Because a mirror requires a response. A mirror requires a response. In fact, here's, here's what I know of you. I know how much time each and every one of you spend in front of the mirror every single day. Here's how I know. You stand there as long as it takes till it gets better. That's what we do. 
We look in the mirror and we stay there as long as it takes until it gets better, right? That's because that mirror requires a response. And, and here's what I've, I, some of you have done this and some of you, I've seen you done it. I've lived with girls, I've seen this happen, is you think it's better and then you're heading out the door and you get one more glance and you realize it's not better enough. And so you go back and you're like, you fix it or you change it or you tuck it in or you tie it back or, or what, you throw a hat on because that's just bad. You just go, I'm going to wear a hat. Whatever it is, you stand there, you look at it until it gets better. And that's because a mirror always requires a response. So here's what we're going to all do tomorrow. We're going to look in a mirror. We're going to feel convicted about what we see. And then we're going to actually do something about it. And James says that's what should be happening when we look into the mirror of God's word. Here's the thing that I think we all need to know. Getting your hair right has far less to do with the direction and quality of your life than getting your heart right. Getting your makeup right has far less to do with the direction and the quality of your life than getting right with your maker. Getting your outfit right and and getting things all matched up and looking good and put together, that's important but it has far less to do with the direction and quality of your life than getting your behavior right. And and, and so let's just be honest for just a second. On the day or the night or the weekend or the week or the season where you created your greatest regret, I bet you looked fine. I bet you looked in a mirror and you looked fine. And that's because you looked in a glass mirror and it required a response and you responded. However, you didn't respond to what you knew you probably should do or shouldn't do, but went ahead and did it anyway. And in that season, created your greatest regret. Here's the thing we have to know. No one gets credit for just looking in the mirror. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in the real world, right? You don't get up tomorrow, look in the mirror, do nothing, and then go into work or go to get coffee or go to breakfast or do whatever it is you do. You don't get, and and when you walk in and you're a mess and somebody says, hey, what's going on? And you don't, you don't get credit for going, well, hey, I I looked in the mirror. You know what they'll probably say? That's great. Did you think about doing something about with what you saw? That's, you know, if people love you enough and they could speak in your life, they may ask you, well, that's wonderful. Maybe they'll even ask you if you had a mirror. You know, they're like, hey, did you have a mirror? Like, yeah, I looked into it. We don't get credit for just looking into the mirror. But in the realm of our spiritual development and in the realm of our personal behavior, we do this all the time. We do that all the time. Well, I looked into God's word. I heard somebody teach some truth. I was convicted by it. I just didn't do anything with it. I didn't do anything about it. I quoted scripture. Wonderful. James says, don't just be hearers. Don't just listen. You have to do something with what you hear. Here's how this kind of connects, hopefully, to our series. If you're in the habit of seeing something but doing nothing now, guess what? You will probably see something and do nothing in your next season. And I know a lot of us get, well, once I and when I and when I, when we and once we, no, Now, if you're in the habit of seeing something and doing nothing now, you will probably carry that habit into the next season of your life, and you will not be prepared for what's next. Fortunately for us, James doesn't stop there. He says this, but, and, and this is one of my favorite words in all of the Bible. I love this word. James is going to introduce to us the first habit that will help us be better prepared for what's next. Here's what James says. He says, but if you look carefully, that doesn't mean a passing glance. That doesn't mean I just stared at it until I memorized it. It means that I actually looked into into this, and we're going to talk about what this is in just a second, but I actually looked and I could see where I was in relationship to that, and I actually stared at it and figured out where I was falling short and where I wasn't measuring up. I actually stared at it. Until I figured it out. He says, but if you look carefully or look intently into the perfect law. What's the perfect law? Right? This is is one of those like, well, the whole Bible. Yeah. 
Yeah, but here's the thing that was kind of interesting. During Jesus' earthly ministry, it wasn't uncommon for the, the question to be asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? That question got asked a lot, not just of Jesus, of, of, of other teachers and everybody else. That was a common question. What is the greatest commandment in the law? What is the greatest commandment in the law? And remember, there's one point where somebody asked Jesus that. And you remember what he did? He turned the question back to them. He's like, well, you tell me. What do you believe it is? And you remember that the gentleman says, well, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, or some version of that. And, and everybody's kind of in the crowd going, yeah, that's, that's what we've... But then there was a time where that question was directed right at Jesus. And you remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and... And then everybody kind of stops because there was never an and before. It was always, that's it. That's all we got to do is just love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then Jesus, and the second is equal to it, is in conjunction with it. You can't have a one without number two, and you can't do two without number one. They, they go together. He says, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. And, and so in, in that one statement, Jesus takes 613 Old Testament laws, and he narrows them down to two. He says, here's what you got to do. You got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then... I don't, here's, here's my perspective on this, and, and we can talk about this if, if you have a little different perspective on it, but, but then do you remember the night of Jesus' arrest, his betrayal and his arrest? Do you remember that night? He's with his, he's with his followers. He's with his, his disciples. Judas has left, and it's just, it's just the 11 that are with him. And do you remember some of the final words he says? He says this to them. He says in, in John chapter 13, he says, I'm going to give you a new command. And I have to imagine all of these Jewish guys sitting around the Jewish teacher, you know, are thinking, okay, are we going from 613 to 614? Is that the new command? Or are we going from two commands to three? I believe, in a sense, Jesus was taking two commands and narrowing down to one. And you remember what that one command was? I want you to love one another the way I have loved you. He says, if you forget 613 commands, if you can't even remember two, remember this one. I want you to love one another the way I've loved you. Not love one another the way you've been loved by others. Not love one another the way you would like to be loved. That's the golden rule. Jesus says this is the platinum rule. I want you to love one another the way I have loved you. And then he did something that they couldn't even understand, I don't think, at that moment. He would be arrested and he would be beaten. And he would give his life away for our sins. And he would rise again to secure our eternity, to guarantee our victory, and basically say, that's how you love. You give your life away. And here's what James says. James says that when we love one another and respond to one another the way God in Christ has loved and responded to us, that we will experience freedom. Right? That when we look carefully into the perfect law of loving one another the way God has loved us, the way that Jesus has loved us, that that actually gains us freedom, that that sets you free. The promise of gazing intently, the point of looking carefully at the perfect law and doing it, not just memorizing it, not just feeling convicted by it, but actually doing it, the, the payoff is, the result is freedom. James says, if you'll do this, if you will actually love one another the way I've loved you, you will experience freedom. Seeing and doing now, listening and doing now, results in freedom later. And the reason I'm passionate about this is because that's the kind of stuff I was taught when I was a kid. And here's the thing, you guys, and if you're young, if you're under 18, listen up for just a second, please. I heard this stuff growing up. But you know what the problem was? I didn't do it. I heard it. I even quoted it. Every once in a while, if I was listening close, I could even feel convicted by it. But I didn't do it. And I made a mess of a lot of stuff as a result. Here's some things that I've heard and tried to do that I hope you'll hear and try to do as well with regard to some areas, right? How about handling money? I was taught 
the biblical pattern looks like this. That we give first, save second, live on the rest. That we give, we save, and we live. And I know, I know giving a percentage of our hard-earned income doesn't sound like freedom, right? That doesn't sound like freedom. Freedom sounds more like live first, right? Save second. And if I feel really guilty, or if they're putting the plate right in front of me at church, then maybe I'll put something I'll give, you know? But, but freedom, in our mind, sounds more like, well, if I, I, I'm going to live first, I'll save what I can, and I'll give if there's some real compelling reason, or I feel guilty enough, or I have a little bit extra, then maybe I'll give. But what I've noticed in my life, and what I've noticed in the lives of other Christians, that when we give first, and we save second, and live on the rest, when we not only hear these things, but we actually do these things now, it brings financial freedom later. And, and, and here's the thing. I don't want you to, to mistake this. I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel, right? So I don't want anybody to walk away going, well, the pastor said that if I give now, I'm going to get a bunch of money. I never said that. Matter of fact, Jesus never said that. So don't confuse all that. And don't confuse it with preachers and people that do teach that. That's not true. That's not in the Bible. That, that's, that, that's not accurate. I'm not saying that if you give, you'll be wealthy. What I'm saying is that handling our finances the way God instructs us to frees us from the slavery of debt. It frees us from the worry and anxiety of money problems. And more importantly, it frees us up to participate more fully and more joyfully in God's kingdom work. There's freedom attached to this. Hey, here's something I, I want you to understand, and I think it's really super important. The reason we give is not so we can get Okay, so if you have a teacher or you have a preacher like stand in front of you and that's what they're trying to motivate you with is, hey, if you give, then you're going to get just ask them to test the theory. Right. I would. I'd walk up to them and say, well, why don't you give me one hundred dollars and then we'll see if God gives you a thousand. Like, let's check it out. Let's see. That's not the reason we give. We don't give to get anybody know why we give anybody like this is just us. Why do we give? I'm going to go really slow. Because it helps people. <laughs> Period. Seriously. Because it helps people. Because it's a tangible way to love one another the way Jesus has loved us. That's why we give, right? It's not so we can get. And if you're in a church where that becomes the motivating factor is give so you can get, I'm going to encourage you, leave that church. Because that's not the reason we give. The reason we give is because it's a tangible way of loving others. The reason we give is so we can help people. We give because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, who in turn gave his life away for us and then told us, I need you to love others the way I love you. That's why we give. It has nothing to do with what we get back. We give in order to love others the way God in Christ has loved us. We look at the perfect law and we decide to do it and not just hear about it. And every one of us ought to do it. We ought to do it because it's a demonstration of the way God in Christ has loved us. And it's an opportunity for us to love others the way he has loved us. How about this one? Forgive. Like we know we're supposed to forgive, but forgiveness, does forgiveness feel like freedom? Let's be honest, right? A lot of forgiveness feels like punishment. Forgiveness feels like I'm hurt and you get off e with free. You get off easy. You, you've done something to me, but I feel like I'm the one that's hurting. I'm the one that's being punished. And you get off free. The guilty person goes free. If I forgive, that means I'm not getting paid back and I'm letting them off the hook. But I have to believe there's some people in here in this room this morning that have truly forgiven, at some point in your life, you've truly forgiven someone for doing something that really hurts you, and you know the freedom that comes with that forgiveness. You know what that feels like. You know when you ultimately, and you finally forgive, and I'm going to be honest with you, it's a process. I, I don't, I don't want to ever fool somebody into thinking, well, just forgive them, meaning you make this decision instantaneously in your mind, and forever and ever they're forgiven. I don't know about anybody else, but a lot of times I wake up the next morning and have to figure out how to forgive again. And then something will happen, I'm like, oh, okay, i got to forgive. i got to forgive again. I got, it's a process. through. But eventually, freedom, that freedom comes with forgiveness. That eventually, your forgiveness, that forgiveness leads us to freedom. So why do we forgive? Because the Bible tells us to, right? In part. But mostly because God in Christ has forgiven us. 
And we're to love others the way Jesus has loved us. We're to forgive others the way that God in Christ has forgiven us. It's really that simple. How about this one? That's a tough one growing up, right? That doesn't sound like freedom. It sounds like the opposite of freedom. But do you know why we should be sexually pure? Do you know why we should be so careful about the way we handle our sexuality? It has nothing to do with getting God to love us more. Or it has nothing to do with God not punishing us. It has everything to do with other people. When you exercise self-control in the area of your sexuality, you are honoring someone else. Not only that, you are honoring every single one of their future relationships as well. You don't become a regret for them as well. By the way, you'll find that sexual purity actually paves the way to intimacy with your spouse. And here's a truth that the Bible points out, and it's an area that I believe our culture needs a serious wake-up call. Exclusivity is what leads to romance, not experience. Exclusivity is what leads to romance, not experience. Waiting and saving yourself for that person is what's going to free you up to have the kind of intimacy you want to have with that spouse eventually. There's going to be freedom in that. Where there's exclusivity and romance in a relationship, there's freedom. How about this one? Serve, right? Serving doesn't sound freeing. Matter of fact, the word servant comes from serve, and we know servants aren't free. But by serving others, we have an opportunity to express to them and love them the way Jesus loved us. By the way, did you know one of the best ways to free yourself from discouragement and and detachment is to actually serve someone else? It's been scientifically proven to boost our mood and boost our outlook that when we're down and we're detached and we're discouraged, it says the best thing you can do is serve someone else. That's not our natural tendency. Our natural tendency is to retreat into our shell. But Jesus said, I want you to love others the way I've loved you. I want you to serve others the way I've served you. That's not why we serve, to, to get our moods adjusted, but it's definitely an awesome side effect of loving others the way Jesus has loved us. We can go on and on, right? And James is right. When we stop and stare and we see our reflection in the mirror of the perfect law that sets us free, and when we honestly look at ourselves and do something about what we see, it makes the difference. Because looking and making the adjustments now is what sets us up for later. It results in freedom later, and here's why. The seasons of our lives are actually connected. And, and, and I've heard this a lot. I've even, I've even been in places in my life where I believe this, right? You know, that, that, that whole idea, well, this is what I'm doing now, but once I get out of the house, then I'll, uh-uh. No, it's connected. Well, this is what I'm doing now as a single, but once I'm married, then, no, nope, it's connected. Well, this is what I'm doing financially now, but once I get a little more money, then I'll, no, nope. no, nope, it's still connected. The seasons of our life are connected. What you choose to do now will either set you up or sink you later. Here's the rest of this verse in James 1. He says, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, and here's the payoff, right? Then God will bless you for doing it. And here's the thing that's that's happening here, and I don't want you to misunderstand this or, or miss the point. James isn't saying that what you do will be blessed. It's actually way better than that. He says that you personally will be blessed by God in the doing of it. Isn't that awesome? He doesn't promise that what you do will be blessed, but that you will be blessed in the doing of of what it is that God has called you to do. And the word blessed simply means happy. The payoff is what happens in you as a result of the response uh, of what God has called you to do. Here's Here's another way of thinking about this. The habit of doing will actually make you happy. The habit of doing will actually make you happy. There is personal fulfillment in responding to what we see in the mirror, right? You you guys have experienced that in a real mirror, right? There's There's some personal fulfillment when you stop and you're like, that looks pretty good. Like, I fixed it. I tucked it. I put the hat on. I did whatever. In the same idea, James says there's blessing and there's happiness and there's personal fulfillment when we look into the mirror of God's word and we respond to what we see. Here's the cool thing. There's a bunch of people sitting in this room this morning that can testify to the truth of that. 
that, that once they surrendered their life to Jesus and once they allowed the Holy Spirit to begin to shape their life through the truth of God's word and they began doing what they saw in God's word they should be doing, there were blessings that came with that. There were blessings in their life as a result of doing what God had called them to do. Was everything perfect? No. Did everything go smoothly every time? No. But you know what? There was a sense of fulfillment. There was a sense of joy. There was a sense of, of purpose. There were blessings that accompanied them in the doing of what it is that God had called them to do. And that's why this habit is such an important step in preparing for what's next. Because being a doer now is preparation for being a doer later, even when the do's change, right? So some people are like, well, you know, what I have to start doing in college is different than what I have to do. Now. Yeah, yeah, but if you're not doing now, you won't do then. Well, well, once I'm married, the do's change. Yeah, but if you're not doing the do's of single life now, you're not going to do the do's of married life then. Remember that idea. A new view, a new do does not make a new you. Just because you're circumstances change just because your environment changed doesn't mean you have changed you carry you into the next season and whatever habits you have now are the habits you're going to carry into the next season and then they will either set you up or they will sink you the very best preparation for what's next is to do what God has called you to do in this season right now and too many times I think we're like well once I and when I Whatever it is God is calling you to do now is the best preparation for what he has for you next. Let me share some quick principles with you as we wrap up, all right? And I think these speak directly to this thought. How about this idea? Obey God and leave all the consequences to him. It's a great thought. That's a great thought. You just do what God has called you to do and let God handle the rest. And if you'll do what God has called you to do in this season... When you get to the next season, you'll be able to look back and see what God did. But don't worry about all the results. Don't worry about all the, all the fallout. Don't worry about how this is all going to work out. Why don't you just do what God has called you to do in this season and let God take care of what happens in the next. How about this one? God takes full responsibility for the life that is wholly devoted to him. He does. He takes full responsibility for a life that's wholly devoted to him. He says, if you devote yourself entirely to me and you do what I've called you to do, I'm going to take care of the results. You don't have to worry about it. I, I'm going to claim and I'll take full responsibility for that. If we want to know what it's like to be in the very center of God's will, then we must be wholly devoted to him and making the adjustments in our lives that his word directs us to make. Here's something my, my grandfather used to say. He used to say, if, if God tells you to run your head through a brick wall, you just start running and you trust God to open a hole. And I used, to, I used to hear him say that. I'm like, what? Like, that doesn't make any sense. But, but here's how I think this connects. I think what James is trying to tell us is that sometimes what you read and what you hear may not make sense. Sometimes what you read and what you hear may seem impractical. Sometimes what you read and what you hear may seem old-fashioned. Sometimes what you read and what you hear may seem like it's the moral code of some past generation but if God tells you to start running, then you just start running. And when you step into the next season, there is going to be freedom and you will be blessed as a result. Even when it doesn't make sense. Even when it's like, I'm only making five bucks an hour and you want me to give a percentage? Yeah, just start doing it now. Because there's blessings and there's freedom in that in the future. Let me be really honest with you. And I think some of you can relate to this. My greatest regrets in life, right? So the things... I wish I could go back and change and undo and redo are associated with times when I heard, but I refused to do. Anybody else relate? That the greatest regrets in our life are typically associated with hearing and not doing. Matter of fact, for some of us, we didn't hear it, didn't want to hear it because we knew we didn't want to do it. I know I'm pressing close on some people, right? That, that those are some of the areas where I end up with the greatest regrets. James tells us that we need to hear, but that's not enough. We have to do. Interestingly enough, Jesus actually taught the same thing, but his teaching came in the form of a parable at the end of one of his most famous sermons, the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to read the first half, and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. Here's what Jesus said. Everyone... 
That's all of us, right? Everyone, then, who hears these words of mine and is convicted by them, can quote them, can share them with their neighbors, can post them on Facebook. Is that what he says? Every one of you that can hear these words of mine and you know them by heart and you feel convicted when you hear them and you share them with your friends that are struggling and you post them on Facebook and you, you tattooed them somewhere on your body or whatever you did with them. It, no, that's what he says. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and what? Uh, say it out loud. Yeah. Does them. Yeah, like some of you are like, I don't want to say that because that means I have to do it. Yeah, it does, actually. That's pretty awesome how that works. Everyone who hears the words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came. And some, I don't know about anybody else, but I read this verse and I could do the motions. Okay, I'm the, am I the only person that grew up in Sunday school like that? All right. He says, and the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall. Because it had been founded on the rock. You know what Jesus was teaching you and me? That the way we lay a solid foundation for our life is by being a doer, not just a hearer. Like if you want a solid foundation for your life, don't just show up and listen. Don't just read. Actually do it. Actually do it. And when things get tough and when things get difficult, your life will not come crashing down. Some of, the, some of the greatest heartbreaks I encounter as a pastor are the stories of people whose lives came crashing down. And you know what they typically have in common? They heard, but they refused to do. They knew and chose not to. They had listened, or they had read, or someone had, had confronted them with the mirror of the truth, and they chose not to do what it was they knew they should do. And if that's your story this morning, if you're like, hey, man, that's where I was, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you showed up. And I'm going to pray for you in just a moment that you'll, you'll do what it is God wants you to do. Because just hearing won't get it done. You'll, you'll cycle back through another series of brokenness because you just continue to do what you know you shouldn't do and refuse to do what you know God's word calls you to do. James is pretty clear. He says this. He says, if you're a doer now, you'll be a doer later. If you're a doer now, if you establish that habit now, you'll have that habit later. So I'm going to give you two questions and we're done. First question, what are you doing now that you shouldn't be doing that you keep telling yourself you'll stop doing later? What are you doing now that you shouldn't be doing that you keep telling yourself, well, I'll stop doing that later. That, you know, once I and when I and once we and when we, what is that? Here's the second question. What are you not doing now that you should be doing that you keep telling yourself you'll start doing later? Right? So first question, what are you doing now that you shouldn't be, that you keep telling yourself you'll stop doing? Second question, what are you not doing right now that you know you should be doing, but you keep telling yourself, well, I'll start doing that later. You know what James would say? You're fooling yourself. You know what Jesus would say? Your life is going to come crashing down. Doing, not just hearing, is what will make all the difference. Doing, not just hearing, will determine if you're prepared for what's next. How many of you want to step into another season of frustration and failure? How many of you are like, yeah, I know what's coming next, and I just want to be frustrated and fail all the way through the next season? Nobody does. James just offered us a remedy for what's next. He just told us what we could begin packing our bags with, right? So here's the question. What do you need to do? What do you need to do? I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to ask you to sit tight for just a second. Father God, I'm so grateful for your word, Lord. And that's sometimes hard to say because when I read it, when we hear it, sometimes, oftentimes, it just cuts through the walls we build and the excuses we offer. 
and it cuts straight to the heart of who we are. But God, I'm grateful that you love us enough to tell us the truth because you have good plans and you have good purposes for us. Heavenly Father, I'm going to ask that you would just help us be willing to hear what you want us to hear and to see what you want us to see. God, I, I, I'm asking if you would give us the wisdom to know what to do with that, whatever it is we're hearing, whatever it is we're seeing. God, I would, I would ask that you would give us the wisdom to know what to do with that or what to stop doing. And then, God, I would ask that you would give us the courage to actually do it. And we just pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.